Continue on physical chemistry, chapter seven. We're beginning section three now. We're gonna talk about the Clapeyron equation. Now first, let's say we have a one component system. Now we have a phase diagram here, pressure on the vertical axes, temperature on the horizontal axes, and we have two phases, alpha and beta. Now these could be any two real phases. It could be like solid and liquid, or solid and vapor, or liquid and vapor, doesn't matter. Now remember, anywhere along the line, both phases alpha and beta are in equilibrium with each other. We're gonna be comparing two points, one and two, with each other. Now we're gonna say that these two points are infinitesimally close together. So the difference in pressure between them is dp, and the difference in temperature between them is dt. So we've, we choose an equilibrium line on the phase diagram. This is called a phase boundary. We're saying points one and two are infinitesimally close, so dt is the difference in temperature, and dp is the difference in pressure. So our goal is to find the slope of this line, or what is the, different, the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature. Now, we know at any point on the line, the two phases are in equilibrium. So the chemical potential of phase alpha is equal to the chemical potential of phase beta. Now we also know that the molar Gibbs energy in phase alpha is the, equal to the molar Gibbs energy in phase beta, at least for a pure substance. Now we don't have to specify the chemical potential I in phase alpha or the chemical potential I in phase beta because the system we're talking about has only one component, one substance. So at point one, we have the molar Gibbs energy in phase alpha at point one is equal to the molar Gibbs energy in phase beta at point one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, at point two, we have the molar Gibbs energy in phase alpha at point two is equal to the molar Gibbs energy in phase beta at point two. But so we can also say at point two that the molar Gibbs energy at point one in phase alpha plus the differential of the molar Gibbs energy in phase alpha is equal to the molar Gibbs energy at point one at phase beta plus the differen molar, a differential of the molar Gibbs energy at phase beta. Now since these two are the same, they're in equilibrium, they're gonna cancel out. So we're left with the differential of the molar Gibbs energy in phase alpha is equal to the mol differential of the molar Gibbs energy of phase beta. We're gonna call this equation one, we'll refer back to it later on. Now if we have just one phase, remember, dg is equal to minus sdt plus vdp plus the sum over all the substances i of the chemical potential i times the differential of the number of moles of substance i, where i is the component. Now we're talking about only a one component system, therefore that simplifies to just the differential of the Gibbs energy is equal to minus the entropy times the differential of temperature plus volume times the differential of pressure plus chemical potential times the differential of the number of moles of the substance. Now remember the molar Gibbs energy is defined as the Gibbs energy divided by N, so solving for Gibbs energy we have Gibbs energy is equal to N times the molar Gibbs energy. Now the differential form of dg then is going to be equal to dg is equal to n dgm plus gm dn. So we're going to substitute that into dg equals minus sdt plus vdp plus mu dn. So we get n times the differential of the molar Gibbs energy plus the Gibbs, molar Gibbs energy times the differential of n is equal to minus sdt plus vdp plus mu dn. Now for pure substance, the chemical potential is equal to the molar Gibbs energy. So we're going to say NDGM is going to be plus GMDN, it's going to be minus SDT plus VDP plus GMDN. Notice those terms cancel out. So we're simplifying, we get N times DGM is equal to minus SDT plus VDP. Now we're going to divide that by N, so we're going to get n times the differential of the molar Gibbs energy divided by n, and that's equal to minus SDT over n plus VDP over n. So the n's cancel out, and we end up with dGm is equal to minus the molar entropy times the differential of temperature plus the molar volume times the differential of pressure. We're going to call that equation 2 for future reference. Now we're going to combine equations 1 and 2. So what we get is minus the molar entropy of phase alpha times the differential of temperature 
plus molar volume in phase alpha times the differential of pressure is equal to minus the molar entropy in phase beta times the differential of temperature plus the molar volume in phase beta times the differential of pressure. Now we're going to factor out, we're going to, we're going to put the dt on one side, the dp is on the other, and we're going to factor them out. So we're going to have minus the molar entropy of phase alpha plus the molar entropy of phase beta times the differential of temperature and the um, molar volume of phase beta minus the molar volume of phase alpha times the differential of pressure. So then we could just solve for the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is equal to the molar entropy of phase alpha minus the molar entropy of phase beta divided by the molar volume of phase alpha minus the molar volume of phase beta. So that is going to be also equal to the change in molar entropy divided by the change in molar volume. That's the intensive form, or the extensive form would be just the change in entropy divided by the change in volume. And this is going in the direction from beta to alpha. Now, if we have a reversible phase transition, beta is in equilibrium with alpha, then delta G is equal to zero. So delta G, remember, is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Solving for delta S, we get delta H divided by T. Because um, delta G was equal to zero. So the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is equal to the um, ent molar enthalpy divided by temperature times the change in molar volume. And that's equal to just delta H over T delta V. This is called the Clapeyron equation. Now, going from liquid to vapor, delta H is going to be greater than zero. Delta V is going to be greater than zero. So dP, the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature, is going to be greater than zero. For solid going to vapor, delta H is greater than zero. Delta, the change in volume is greater than zero. So the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is greater than zero. Now, for solid going to liquid, delta H is greater than zero. Delta volume is usually greater than zero. So the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is usually greater than zero. Now, one exception, of course, is water. For water going from solid to liquid, the delta H is greater than zero, but delta V is less than zero. So the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is less than zero. Now remember, delta V is going to be the V the volume of the H2O liquid, which is smaller, minus the volume of the H2O um, solid, which is bigger. So delta, the change in volume is less than zero. Now let's talk about liquid vapor and a solid vapor equilibrium. So if we have solid in equilibrium with gas, the molar volume is going to be, oh, this should be um, delta molar volume. Oh, well, that's weird. Am I missing a delta here? Okay, so the, the change in the molar volume is going to be equal to the molar volume of the gas minus the vo molar volume of the liquid, so it's going to be roughly equal to the molar volume of the gas. For the solid going to gas, again, the change in the molar volume is going to be the molar volume of the gas minus the molar volume of the solid, but because the solid is so much smaller than the gas, it's going to be roughly equal to the molar volume of the gas. If we assume an ideal gas, then, the change in the molar volume of the liquid is going to be roughly equal to the molar volume of the gas, which will be RT over P, the gas constant times temperature divided by pressure. Using the Clapeyron equation, we could say the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is equal to the change in molar enthalpy divided by temperature times the change in molar volume. And then we also get the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is roughly equal to pressure times the change in molar enthalpy divided by the gas constant R times the temperature squared. Now since the derivative of pressure or since the derivative of the natural log of pressure with respect to pressure is 1 over P then we can rearrange that and get dP over P is equal to d ln of P. So substituting in, we'll get dP over P is roughly equal to the change in the enthal molar enthalpy divided by RT squared dT. So then we get the differential, the natural log of P, 
divided by dt is roughly equal to the change in molar enthalpy divided by rt squared. This is called the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. This applies to solid gas or liquid gas because of those assumptions we made about the um, difference in density between the condensed phase and the vapor phase. So this doesn't apply near the critical point because um, obviously near the critical point you're going to be the this assumption won't hold true. The density of the liquid and the gas will be similar enough that they this won't work. Remember at the critical point the molar volume of the liquid is roughly equal to the molar volume of the gas. So the change in molar volume is going to be uh, it's this assumption we made about the change in molar volume being roughly equal to the change in the molar volume of the gas is um, not true. Let me check make sure I fix that correctly. Okay, so this this was correct. We're just going to say that the molar volume is approximately equal to the molar volume of the gas. The molar volume is approximately equal to the molar volume of the gas. So it was correctly before. It was correct before. Okay, so the derivative with respect to temperature of 1 over temperature is minus 1 over the temperature squared. So the rearranging that, we get the derivative. The differential of 1 over t is equal to minus 1 over t squared dt. And dt, then, is minus t squared differential of 1 over t. So using that, we get the differential in the natural log of p is equal to minus t squared differential of 1 over t, which is roughly equal to the change in the molar enthalpy over RT squared. Now remember, uh, T can't be zero, otherwise we're dividing by zero in this case. Notice the temperatures are going to cancel out. So if, if T was zero, we're dividing by zero and canceling out zeros and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. But less, luckily we can't get to absolute zero, so that's not a problem. So the differential of the natural log of P divided by the differential of one over T is roughly equal to minus the change in the molar enthalpy divided by R. And remember, R is the gas constant, 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. So here's a graph of natural log of pressure against 1 over T. And here we go, it's curving down this way. If it's an, if it's an endothermic process, the change in molar enthalpy is going to be greater than zero. Now remember, the slope is minus delta HM over R. So this is the graph f for a endothermic process. If it was an exothermic process, then it would be going up this way. So if delta, the change in enthalpy of sublimation is going to be greater than zero, then the change in enthalpy of vaporization is also going to be greater than zero. So that just tells you, you know, you can sublimate or you can go the reverse direction, or etc. So the differential of the natural log of P is roughly equal to the change in the molar enthalpy divided by RT squared dt. We're going to integrate this. So we have the integral from pressure 1 to pressure 2 of the differential of the natural log of P, which is roughly equal to the definite integral from temperature 1 to temperature 2 of the change in molar enthalpy over RT squared with respect to temperature. Now we're just going to assume that the molar enthalpy of formation is constant over the range of T. So well, I guess this should be called the latent heat of transition. But anyway, the natural log of P evaluated from uh, P1 to P2 is roughly equal to, pull out the constants, delta H molar over R, integrated T1 to T2 of 1 over T squared dt, which is minus delta HM over R, 1 over T, evaluated from T1 to T2. So that gives us the natural log of P2 over P1 is roughly equal to minus the... Um, Enthalpy of the molar enthalpy of transition over R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. This is the integrated form of the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. Now this is only for solid in equilibrium gas or liquid in equilibrium gas, and the temperature is not near the critical temperature, because it's based on some assumptions. One is that the vapor is an ideal gas. Two is that the um, enthalpy of form vaporization is independent of temperature. Three, that the volume of the liquid is much less than the volume of the gas. We write it VL is much less than VG. Um, four, that the system is equilibrium, of course. Five, that T1 and T2 are nowhere near the critical temperature. Now, if P1 equals ATM, then T1 is equal to the normal boiling point, which is a constant. 
So let's say that we let T2 equals T and then P2 equals P. So NBP, remember, stands for normal boiling point. So the natural log of pressure divided by ATMs is to get the units to disappear. It's going to be roughly equal to minus the molar enthalpy of a transition divided by R times 1 over T plus the molar enthalpy of transition divided by R times the temperature and normal boiling point. So for li this is for liquid in, um, gas because we're talking about boiling point and not near the critical temperature. So let's say we make up a constant, capital B, and say that's equal to E to the uh, power of the molar enthalpy of transition divided by R times the normal boiling point. Now remember, if the natural log of X is equal to A plus B, then X is equal to E times A times, or E to the A power times E to the B power. So we have pressure divided by ATM is roughly equal to B times E to the minus delta molar H divided by RT. All this is in the exponent. Now this is negative, so you could just put it on the bottom. So you could put B over E to the negative delta HM over RT. So what this shows us is that as temperature increases, the vapor pressure goes up exponentially. But this is why um, if you have ethers in the lab, they're actually stored in the refrigerator to keep them from evaporating because they have such low vapor pressure. Now let's talk about solid liquid equilibrium. So we're going to um, start with the Clapeyron equation. We have the derivative of pressure with respect to temperature is equal to the latent heat of fusion divided by temperature times the um, change in volume with fusion. And that's going to be equal to the change in entropy of fusion divided by the change in volume of fusion. Remember, FUS is fusion. That's melting, not nuclear fusion. But the reason we could substitute that is because the change in entropy of fusion is the change in enthalpy of fusion divided by the temperature the norm of the melting point. So remember, delta S fusion is the entropy of the liquid minus entropy of the solid. The change in volume of the fusion is the volume of the liquid minus volume of the solid, and MP stands for melting point. So we want to integrate that formula. So we're going to have the integral from pressure 1 to pressure 2 of dp, and that's equal to the integral from temperature 1 to temperature 2 of the um, latent heat of fusion divided by the change in volume of fusion times 1 over the temperature of the melting point dt, and that's equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of the um, change in entropy from the f fusion divided by the change in volume from the fusion, dt. Now let's just assume that the change in enthalpy of fusion and the change of entropy of fusion are not temperature dependent. Well, then we're just going to end up with P2 minus P1 is roughly equal to the change in the en latent heat of fusion divided by the change in volume of fusion. Oh no, that's multiply. Never mind. Okay, times the temperature that at the melting point times temperature 2 minus til temperature 1. So that's going to be roughly equal to the um, change in entropy of fusion divided by the change in volume of fusion times temperature 2 minus temperature 1. But this is only for solid liquid equilibrium because, you know, we're at the fusion melting point. So this is actually a good equation under really high pressures, like under a glacier. That's all for section 3.